Dun 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 dun. Insert the music here. Insert the music here. All right. Well, focus, focus, focus. There we go. Good evening, and welcome to Merriweather's World. I am your host, Dr. Mark Merriweather Vorderbergen, creator of Foraging Texas, author of Idiot's Guide Foraging, and doer of many, many, many other things. Hey, good evening, Henry. Good evening, Kathleen. Cool. People approach the tribe gathers. All right. So tonight we will be talking with Professor Brandon Laurie. He will be joining us as we talk about post hurricane activities to ensure safety and survival. So we've done before, we've done a little bit during now, the, the you know, moments to days after the hurricane is what we'd like to share some thoughts and experiences and professional advice, if you will. Hey, good evening, Sandra. All right, as usual though, I need to start with the housekeeping stuff. So you're just going to bear with me as I do some shout outs to the great sponsors. Hey, Kelly, and uh, we'll get through that quickly. All right, so of course the Foraging Texas website is where you want to go for information on over 200 wild edible and medicinal plants. Oops, did it show up? Okay. There we go. And so definitely want to check that out. That is the center of my universe. So from there, you can see everything else I'm doing, including the upcoming classes. So if I can just uh, do, whoop, do this. Whoop, hey, and there's our guest just hanging out. I got him muted. So uh, yeah, upcoming classes, a uh, bunch of stuff coming up. Uh, now into February, uh, so there's plenty of chances to see me, and keep in mind also more will be added uh, as we go. Hey, Donald. Hey, Kimberlyn. Hey, Snow. Okay. Uh, let me just do this. Okay, my book and my Amazon store. Hey, Uncommon Bees. Good to see you. We'll get to you. So, of course, I'm going to pop back to me here for a second. The foraging, uh, Idiot's Guide Foraging, 70 plants found all across North America. And as proof, there's like the North American map focus of the different places you can find the different things, multiple pictures, if there's a mimic, all that sort of thing. You can purchase it from Amazon. I will tell you the only way I actually get any money anymore from the book because Idiot's Guy doesn't play royalties, is if you buy it from the Amazon link that's just put, been put up. And then also throughout the night, uh, I will be referring to the hurricane, hurricane preps uh, stuff there on the Amazon store. For those of you who are interested in wearing your Foraging Texas proudly, of course, we want the uh, Foraging Texas, oop, there we go, <laughs> uh, t-shirt shop at Cafe Press, and not just t-shirts, but water bottles and bags and all sorts of cool stuff like that. You can look cool in the hot weather with your Foraging Texas web uh, shirt. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now let's jump into sponsors, people that actually... Uh, want me to talk about their stuff and honestly make it worth my while. For instance, Wazoo Survival. And let's throw them up there. They are the creators of the Forging Bandana. And not only did I work with them on that, but they work with me on all my live broadcasts. Wazoo Survival is the uh, organization, the company, that pays for the StreamYard uh, software website account that I use to do these shows. So yay, Wazoo Survival, we love you. And there's all sorts of good stuff there, not just the foraging bandana, but lots of other stuff too. If you spend time out in the woods, that is something you want. Okay, and of course, Uncommon Bees. Whoops, did that not go up? Okay, get up there. I talk faster than the computer can keep up with, apparently. 
that's interesting. Or I'm having glitchiness. There we go. Okay. So uncommon bees. B, 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 B. And all their bee-related stuff. So infused honeys, beeswax, uh, all sorts of stuff. And there is an almost, I don't know, the last time I checked, there were 60-some different infused honeys. Uh, one they're very proud of, and rightly so. Oh, they got pumpkin spice infused honey. Way to go. Tap that fall collection. Where is the... <sighs> Oop, where is the, ah, there we go. The sacred seven infused honey. So with the seven most uh, medicinally active mushrooms out there, you can get them all in an infused honey form. So really, really awesome stuff there. Okay, so Uncommon Bees. And of course, if you use the Forking Weeds coupon code that I posted there, uh, you will actually get 25% off your order between now and midnight tonight. All right, another big one. Shout out to tribe member Ricardo Shilly Shelly. I know his real name, but that's his herbalist name. Uh, for herbs. And if you can see this, he is the medicine man I, the medicine man, use when I need some special blend made up uh, that I can't get or to discuss different blends with him. Uh, so the great thing about uh, the herbs organization is you can contact them and they will set up a Zoom meeting and you can kind of discuss what the issue might be. And then he will give you the recommendations for what uh, would be the best herbal products to use for those. So very, 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 very cool there. Okay, and to my bush, oh, and uh, if you use the Forking Weeds uh, coupon code with herbs between now and midnight tonight, you get 15% off. Okay, for those of you who are my, are my outdoor buddies, such as Professor Brandon Laurie, outdoor buddy extraordinaire, uh, Campcraft Outdoors. I will tell you, if you want some heavy-duty but lightweight and damn near indestructible uh, sort of heavy-duty, lightweight packs and haversacks and, and gear holders and the sort of things you need when you are out in the woods off the trail, you definitely want to go and check out the Campcraft offerings. Made here in the U.S., hand-waxed for waterproofness and just damn good gear. I love my stuff. But wait, there's more. And we had the recent giveaway, but uh, fear and dread. So if you are looking for emergency survival gear and hard to find items right now, uh, the fear and dread is a place to check out. A fully functioning battle station, no, fully functioning survival store. Uh, with everything you need for urban and suburban survival, uh, and rural for that matter. And did I get the, oops. Okay. And with their coupon code Merryweather, you get 5% off orders of $100 or more. And let me tell you, it's easy to suddenly find your cart filled with lots of really cool stuff that is actually extremely useful and could save your life, the life of someone you love, or the life of a complete stranger someday. And what better gift is there than that? Okay, and then one last one. And you're probably going to hear about these guys repeatedly tonight. So True, Ar Ar sorry, Arbor True, uh, one of the top arborist tree doctor organizations in the nation. They are actually located here in uh, Houston area but they actually travel all over the country to deal with situations. Right now they have teams, obviously they have teams over in Louisiana uh, helping with their hurricane stuff there. Uh, those of you who may not know, uh, a few weeks ago, Iowa got hit with a storm with hurricane level winds and had a bunch of trees down there. So they are up there. Uh, last year, after all the California fires, they were out there dealing with all the burned and dead and falling over trees. 
and they're heading back there again uh, once these fires calm down again in California. But they are experts with tree doctoring. So not just pruning, but diagnosing fungal and parasite infestations and coming up with solutions to cure the tree rather than just remove the tree. Think of them as like dentists for the tree. They're not just going to yank the tree out. They're going to do everything they can to save the tree for you. And now, uh, actually, no, I think it's over with, but you probably can still request it. Just tell them Meriwether told you. They have this really cool new uh, yard treatment. Uh, if you remember your high school biology, the nitrogen fixing legumes, they have the nodules on their roots that take the nitrogen in the in nitrogen gas in the air, break it into nitrates that the plants can use. Uh, specifically, uh, symbiotic relationship between the bacteria and legume family plants. Well, there are bacteria that will do that, and they figured out one that will pretty much bind to the roots of any plant and convert any plant into a nitrogen fixer, which is absolutely awesome from a fertilizer and healthy plant point of view for your yard. So they can do that treatment too while they're there taking care of your trees. Whew. Okay, uh, I guess that's enough of that. So let us give a warm tribal welcome to Brendan. Woo! Yay, Brendan, welcome back. Thanks, hey. How are you doing, man? I'm doing great, I'm doing great. Doing the cool, same. Cool. The school, teaching. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Stand busy with all that, man. All this yep. craziness. Oof. All right. So uh, those of you who have been here before realize that Brandon uh, is a preparedness survival expert. He has books on the subject. He's been interviewed even on MTV on this. And luckily, he happens to be a friend of mine. So life is good. OK, so tonight we are talking about hurricane preparedness. Or, sorry, post hurricane stuff, things to do. After the hurricane has hit, you're, you know, the morning after or whatever, you're looking around going, damn, where do I even start? And so to start it off, I have a pop quiz for you, Professor Brandon Laurie. Okay. And, and, and okay, so I know some of his back history besides the fact that he's a professor. And I, I'm really excited to finally hit one of a professor with a pop quiz. Um, he had a very traumatic experience in a storm a number of years ago. Okay, the scenario. The morning after the storm, the storm has passed. Yeah. There's a tree through your roof. Yes. And there's another tree leaning precariously. What do you do? Which do you take care of first? I I call a tree company and they come take care of it. I call I call Arbor True. That's what I call. Uh, so I've already got wait, I've already got one on the house. One in the house. Yeah. What's like a puncture through the roof. And another leaning precariously. So I cut the one leaning, let it hit the house, and call insurance. Just All right, cool. In the storm. Yep. So in the case of a situation after the storm, yeah. leaning trees are way more dangerous than the trees that have already fallen. Yep. Because you don't know when suddenly they are going to let go and come down. If you are up on the roof working on the one tree, yep. and suddenly you have another tree on top of you, especially on roofs, you know, okay. so... Yeah, so and, I just and, and that's so true because um, during that that same storm, the soil was extremely saturated, um, and that's exactly what had happened. There was a few small trees in the backyard that they just slowly throughout the day, just slowly made their way over. Mm -hmm. And it was fast, but it totally could have been, especially if they were heavier trees. So you're one hundred percent. That is it. That is it. Super yep. dangerous. Okay, whoop whoop. We lost your camera. All right, I'm coming All back. Right. Okay, so uh, something to think about in the case of a hurricane or you know any sort of you know disaster of that nature, you really have to assume you are going to be on your own for at least three days. Even the U.S. government, for as long as they've been talking about us, they tell you, you have to be able to take care of yourself for at least three days before you can realistically accept or uh, expect any help. Now, you might be in a place where help comes sooner, but you got to make sure you have three days of food, water, power, you know, cell phone, all that sort of thing. Yep. So very important there. Three days of food, water, and power. Yeah. Okay. What do you got? Uh, so, yeah, yeah. So, you know, one of the first things I want to just kind of mention 
is uh, after any type of storm, uh, especially in these scenarios that we're talking about where, you know, we might have three days without, you know, anybody coming to check on us, how important it is not to just cast hazard to the wind and just start cutting everything down and trying to clean everything up. You really have to kind of go at it slow uh, because now the risk is even higher. Um, it's kind of like I, I talked to my dad. He lives out um, probably about half an hour to maybe an hour away from a hospital. And it's one of those things where you have to really consider the risk because nobody's going to be there for you immediately. Mm -hmm. you know, the ambulance isn't going to be there in like five minutes. It's going to be 45 minutes before somebody uh, gets there. And so the same thing in terms of being very precautious as you go out and try to remove some of these limbs and everything, you really have to say, is this something I can do? And what's the risk associated with it? So in my mind, I'm a big, I'm a big risk assessment. As you know, as all of our talks, <laughs> we always talk about risk, you know, yep. like, what's acceptable, what's not. And so that is kind of how I, I go about this. And so that's kind of the first thing, the first tool in the toolbox is really, is this something that I want to do or can it, can I leave it and not worry about it? Yeah. And, and that actually brings up, I'm going to go sideways here a second. Uh, the British military, the rule is if you get separated from your, your troops and you get lost, mm -hmm. the first thing you're supposed to do, assuming it's a safe situation, is make a cup of tea. Yeah. Sit down and make a cup of tea and assess the situation rather than panicking and running off and doing things. Because in a hurricane, you got trees. You got, it's, it's real easy to panic. You need to stop have your tea. Okay, this is actually a pina colada, <laughs> which is not what you would be drinking, but drink your tea and assess the situation. Spend, you know, 10 minutes at least just thinking about things. Uh, another thing you mentioned, help coming to you. So that segues greatly into what I uh, wanted to bring up, and that is chainsaw safety. Yeah. yeah. So, and I'm going to put up a, a cool link here, if I may. Well, let's go up. Okay, yeah, so Husqvarna, and let me put the link up here. They have a whole big thing on how to clean up after a storm with your chainsaw and things you, know, things you wouldn't have even thought about. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I saw uh, after Hurricane Ike was a lot of people didn't know how to safely use their chainsaw. Yeah. In particular, there were branches and they would just start cutting the branch. And more than once, I thought, you know, they'd start cutting at the top. And we're talking big branches. Mm -hmm. And after a certain point, the branch would break and there'd be this long connection. Yeah. And I saw a guy, he cut through then that connection, causing it to slap back yeah. and knock the chainsaw. And he just about decapitated himself. Wow. So knowing the proper way to trim branches and remove branches with your chainsaw is actually just the starting point. So like I said, there's a link here for how to use your chainsaw uh, safely and assess the situation and you know the order of removal and all that sort of stuff you need to know. And then of course also, you don't want to forget safety glasses, ear protection, and hopefully some, you know, if not work boots, well, if not steel-toed boots, work boots, and something I'm a big fan of is the chainsaw chaps. Yes. The They're these uh, Kevlar chaps that if the chainsaw blade touches them, uh, the blade gets suddenly tangled up in a bunch of fibers rather than cutting through your leg. So yeah. very, very, very important. Uh, know how to use your chainsaw? If you see other people who obviously don't know how to use their chainsaw, you might want to suggest to them some things and point out like what Brandon said that, hey, help is days away. Yeah. So if something grievous happens, you're out of luck. Yeah. I want to piggyback on that one. We can sit here and talk about chainsaws all night. We should have <laughs> Maybe we'll have to. Um, oh. And that is uh, when you're cutting, Again, don't get in a hurry. I'm a big fan of, instead of cutting off a big branch that I don't know how it's going to move, cut off little sections at a time. Because again, yeah. I'm like, you know what? The, the, the time that I'm, I'm trying to save, I, I could send myself to the hospital. Why not mm -hmm. just spend a few more minutes, make little cuts? Because then you can kind of see how that tree 
Exactly. Adjust. How it shifts and how as the center of gravity changes and all that. Absolutely. Plus, you're going to have to cut them up into smaller pieces anyway, yeah. and it's easier when they're up in the ground, you know, off the ground. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, give us another one. Okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Pull my list up here. Yep. Okay, so one that I'm a big fan of, um, I've got a few items around here for me to play with, and I'll, I'll pull those up in just a minute. Um, everyone's interested in power. Uh, we kind of had a run on this. Uh, I just wanted to mention generators, and I believe that's something that's probably on your list as well, um, as having one prior to uh, the event happening, right? So power is always a, a, a concern. I've got another uh, accessory I'll talk about in a minute. But there's a lot of safety things to go along with generators as well. Um, I was actually filling up gas this, this past couple of weeks um, for my generator. And a guy was, was talking to me about it. And he said, some guy fired his generator up in the garage and almost burned his house down. And I was like, oh, no. And so it's some of these things that we kind of forget about. You know, he was testing it out, which is something you also should do with generators. Mm -hmm. Check it every year. Mm -hmm. uh, is you got to make sure you're outside safe. You can't run these things indoors. It's easy to think like, oh, it's just a small one. No, you got to make sure that these things are outside and not away from the home. Yep. Okay. And then, of course, the carbon monoxide. Uh, our neighbor in Hurricane Ike, they had a generator going outside their door. You know, they had the power cords coming through the door. And during the night, the wind shifted. Oh. And they all noticed they started getting headaches, and he was smart enough to realize, oh, damn, that's a yeah. sign of carbon monoxide poisoning. Okay, but uh, you, you, you mentioned about uh, generator accessories. Yes. Is again, a perfect segue. See, we didn't plan this, folks, but we know each other so well, we can just take what the other one says and run with it. Right. So I'm going to show something here. Oh, yeah. And oops, i got to untangle it. Okay, so you're probably wondering, what is this goofy thing that Mark has? All right, one of the big issues after a hurricane is there are criminals that drive through the neighborhoods listening for, for generators, mark where it's at, and then have been known to come back late at night, early in the morning, and steal said generators. So if you go out onto my patio and lift a particular potted plant, Underneath it, you will see a strange little metal bar coming out of the ground. It's connected to some other bars and stuff that are buried and cemented in the ground. So this is what I lock my generator to. Mm -hmm. I have it pre-placed. There's no way anyone's going to get this out of the ground. The, the one I have under the ground is, is longer and bigger and, like I said, cemented in. Part of the bar actually goes under the patio itself, the patio slab. And so I have a really secure thing to chain my generator to so no one can steal it. Because I have so much trust and faith in mankind. Right. <laughs> so, it, does happen. it does happen. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, locking up your stuff is important. Oh, sure. uh, just kind of talking about power again. Um, something that, again, it's easy to kind of forget about, and that is charging your cell phone uh, so that you do have the communication. And so a generator might be a little over overblown for that one, but uh, little power banks like these things, this is a solar mm -hmm. one. Um, but those are super important because, one, you need to know the information after the storm. You need to know, is there another storm? Is there a power outage? You know, all these different things that, that you need to make sure that you contact. And what's kind of surprising is once the power is out, how many people don't have a way to charge their, their uh, uh, phone other than their car. I mean, now you're mm -hmm. burning your gas or killing your battery doing that. And so by having something like this after makes a world of difference because it's one less thing you've got to worry about. So I just mm -hmm. want to throw that a quick mention. Yep. And uh, you're right. And Nowadays, people don't use transistor radios. That's one thing I always have in my, my hurricane kit is batteries and that to pick up the news. But with the cell phone, especially the power outage, uh, one of the things along those lines is you should know the, and I'm going to pop this up here, hmm. the website for uh, what the power outages are in, you know, for your area. So like I belong to Centerpoint. 
And so one of the things I have saved on my phone is their website that shows where are the power outages and what the estimated time is for that power to come back. Very, very, very handy. If nothing else, it gives you hope or makes you realize just how long you need to be ready to go without power. Yes. Um, I, I will tell you, uh, in my opinion, Centerpoint can be somewhat optimistic in its projections about when the power will be back on for what they're saying. But like here, uh, the uh, there's an outage in Tomball. Uh, Estimated restoration time is pending. Okay. Uh, seems like there's there's 23 people without power down in downtown Houston. Uh, estimated restoration time, September 3rd, 8.45 p.m. So they got a ways to go. So, you know, things like that. Knowing where your power is coming from and when it will be restored gives you a lot of comfort and or data point that you need to make decisions in what's going on. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to, again, piggyback off of that. A, a perfect case is hurricane Laura, what we just had. Um, I'm up in Montgomery County. Mm. We got nothing over here. Absolutely nothing. We were not affected. We didn't get any wins, but yet we were experiencing rolling blackouts or rolling brownouts. Sorry. Out. Yeah because of all of the transmission lines that were damaged over in Louisiana. And so a lot of false sense of security that, oh, we missed it, we're fine. And I'm over here waiting for the ball, other ball to drop saying, well, we're not out of this yet. We, we don't know how the, the power system's gonna work. And sure enough, yep. seeing that. luckily I didn't experience that. I was on a, a different grid for some, I don't know how that happened, but. but <laughs> lucky. Exactly, so just because you miss something, you still have to be prepared in the next couple of weeks that, you know, you could still experience some of those, those after effects for sure. Yep. Oh. That actually happened to me with hurricane Ike after it was all said and done. I took all the batteries out of the flashlights and put them in the drawer and the batteries and the flashlights together. Cause you don't want the, the batteries to rupture and, you know, destroy the flashlight. I went on a business trip and I got a frantic call from Mrs. Weather that the power was out. And none of the flashlights had batteries in them. <laughs> and, and so and that's when I realized, okay, leaving one or two, you know, kind of cheap disposable flashlights is a good idea. But now I'm also going to piggyback more on what you're thing and talk about water Yes. and storing water. Uh, a lot of people, when the hurricane is coming, they will fill up, you know, containers of water and ice and, and have them ready in case the power goes out, the pumps that, you know, put the water up to the water tower goes out, or there may be other issues that interfere with the water supply. And then the next day, hurricane is gone, no damage, we got power, we got water, fine, dump everything out. And then five hours later, learn that there's a, you know, some sort of damage to the water treatment plant, and they have a boil your water command or something like that. And suddenly they're back in the 18th century, treating their water that way. So, I, I, I just uploaded a video today on that, actually. So, oh, yeah. 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 I hope I, I, I did I steal this one from you? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Okay. But yeah, so hold on to your water uh, again, at least a week or more yeah, until yeah. you have an all clear that the water treatment plants are up and running and taking, especially in the Houston area, because it's all surface water. And so it requires extra treatment and, and care. So even though you, your area might be okay, the water treatment plant that feeds you or waters you, I guess, may be out. So hold on to your water. Yeah, yeah. No, no I, we, we just, uh, we, we have the same mindset. It's what it is. That's why we're <laughs> thinking so much alike. We're like, okay, how do we deal with that? Um, I'm going to shift over to um, tarps. Me tarps. And when I say tarps, I don't mean like the little free Harbor Freight 5x7, 10x10. I mean the biggest mother honker <laughs> find for tarps. And here's the 20 one. foot by 20 foot. Man, I, I, I bought a, gosh, well, I think it was a 50 by 50. So Damn. I, okay. I, that's... I, it was huge. So here's why. 
you can make a bigger tarp smaller. You can't take it, make a smaller tarp bigger. Um, mm -hmm. Just too, there's just even if you start stacking tarps, which I've had experience in. So uh, let me reference back to the story that that Mark was mentioning about uh, my house. So this was during either the tax day floods or Memorial Day floods. I don't remember which one at this point. Uh, but the top of a tree uh, was blown out, landed on top of our house, two story home. And so I wasn't getting up there because it was raining. It was getting dark. It's happened right as the kids got home from school. Mm. So that was really frightening. Um, anyway, this tree punctured through the roof. We had water coming in from the rain into the upstairs, which made its way downstairs. And it was just still so much anxiety about that. It's, it was crazy. Anyway, the point of this was um, I had tarps and I had some pretty big ones but none that size to just completely cover that whole area. And so while I covered most of it, it rained throughout the night. And so we'd still get some little tricklets that would come through because they just kind of made their way through a branch because there's a tree sitting on there. I can't move it at night. Yeah. Um, and so uh, the bigger the tarp you get, uh, the, the better, because again, you can fold it to whatever configuration you need. And with tarps, um, what I found was, I know a lot of times people are like, well, throw sandbags on it and, and all these things. At this point, if your roof is damaged, you just nail the sucker down. And there you go. How to tarp a roof. Yep. Now, <laughs> I, you know what, I was curious about this and I went and looked. I've got a, I've got a problem with this picture here. Okay. And my problem is, do you see how the two by four is running parallel to the gutter with the tarp? Oh, so it's going to act as a dam going to act as a dam and yeah. so now if you have a puncture in that tarp somewhere or you've nailed it with a, a roofing nail that's going to allow that water to seep and follow that nail so i have a problem yeah. with that one so the way that i've always been been told to do this again i'm not an expert on this so if you're a roofer out there yelling at your screen my apologies is to always run them perpendicular to the edge or to the to the to the slant is that the, the right the, yeah whatever. or run them down yeah. So, so run them down, down, yeah, rather than across. Yeah, what would that be? Perpendicular, <laughs> parallel, I guess. Yeah, however, yeah, perpendicular. parallel to the slant, perpendicular. Okay, you ah, I know. You don't let it run along the contour line. There you go. That's yeah. that's it. I knew we'd get it at some point <laughs> because um, we're wild nerds. But uh, you know, roofing nails are great to kind of secure some of the areas because you don't want air or wind getting underneath it. But if you can get some type of stripping two by fours, or even if it's like a one by two, keep some of those handy around the house because that surface area of nailing that down to your roof does a fantastic job of keeping that tarp uh, from moving. And you do want it as smooth as possible. Yeah. And yeah. We're, oh. oh, I was just going to say, and so uh, the rest of that story was uh, the next day, I did get this mother honking tarp um, and got up there, but there's still a tree on the roof. So we're trying to, you know, move, move stuff around to, to kind of put it over the whole thing. Um, so here I am wet roof with a handsaw. I decided not to get on a roof with a chainsaw again, assess your roof. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was wet and my neighbors were helping. It was awesome. Uh, big shout out to them. Oh, and I forgot to mention uh, it was two days after I had a vasectomy. Uh, so sorry, too much information there, guys. <laughs> this is how you manage risk, I guess. Was <laughs> well, very cautious, very cautious. But um, once we got up there and we got the tarp on, it was it was fantastic. So make sure you have a, a big tarp. There, it's a kind of a big cost up front. Mm -hmm. But man, talk about re reducing your anxiety. Um, mm -hmm. We stayed up all night with buckets of water. I mean, yeah. We for an hour, get up, go dump the buckets. It was, it was wild, man. Uh, so I can't, I can't stress enough to have at least one big tarp to cover your roof. Yep. And you mentioned roofing nails. If I can uh, throw out a better idea, there's what's called capped nails. That's what I meant. So, okay. Yeah. So it's a, okay. So a capped nail. Think of it as a nail through a plastic bottle cap. That's what I meant. I'm and sorry. so it has a bigger holding surface when you nail it down yeah okay good but i put up the link to this video definitely check it out because there's some really good techniques uh as brandon mentioned have someone help you do not try and work 
a 40 by 40 foot tarp on a roof by yourself. No. This is definitely something, you know, especially for our number of houses are damaged. You go down the block and, you know, just put the tarps over each person's roof. Hopefully they have the tarps in place. If not, you make do. But definitely there's a proper way of putting on a tarp on your roof to minimize the damage. As Brandon mentioned, go ahead and nail through that because you're going to have to replace the whole roof anyway, most likely. Yep. So don't worry about the damage you're doing, but there are ways of putting the holes that are still in a manner that will minimize any water from future storms, excuse me, future storms coming through them Yeah. Uh, because it's probably going to rain again. Yes. Yes. Okay. Oop, we lost you again. It's all right. That's all me. Not bad. All right. Okay. Uh, whoops. Here, here's something, and I, I don't know if this is a, a big problem anymore or not. Don't burn candles. Don't use candles as your light source. Sherry Watson mentioned, hey, Sherry, how you doing? The solar landscaping lights where you just put them out and all day long they charge up and then that night they're glowing. Yeah, use that. Because again, as Brandon mentioned at the beginning, emergency services may not be able to get to you for several days. So if your house is suddenly on fire, it may take the fire, you know, people in the fire department a while to get there. So candles are just a bad idea, especially if they're, you know, if the house shifted any, if there's any gas leaks or anything like that. But from the risk assessment, having just fire in your house is generally a bad idea. <laughs> so something to keep in mind, the solar lights, yes, uh, uh, Sherry, that's that's exactly what people should use, and they're they're like two bucks a piece right yeah. now at Walmart. Yeah. So, very good thing there. If you can you know charge them up, put one in your bathroom, put it in the kitchen. They're enough to read by. They're enough to scroll Facebook on your cell phone by. So, yeah, they're yeah. really fantastic. They're really good. Yep. Um, my my next one is kind of a two part, but very quick. And the the first part I want everyone to do either tonight or tomorrow morning. And that is take your cell phone and just take pictures of your house. Go around, take pictures of the interior and take pictures of the exterior. Um, this will save you a lot of headache um, if you ever have to make an insurance claim. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the second part of that is when you, if you ever do have any type of damage um, after the storm, you know, most people are gonna take a photo anyway, just to be like, oh, look what happened. But take a lot of photos. Um, you know, it, it takes no time to do, but I, I can't tell you how many photos I've had, I had to send to the insurance. Now the adjuster will come out and also take their own photos, but you have that documentation as well. And that's going to be really important further down the road, especially if something, um, has happened or like a tree hits your house, take a photo, and then maybe something else happens, God forbid, mm. um, and you can document these things like this happened on this day, this happened on that day. So again, it's one of those things where something happens and you're kind of freaking out, drink your tea, right? Get a British accent and then <laughs> the camera. Yeah, tap your inner Madonna. There you go. <laughs> Pose and take some photos. Um, but yeah, so, so that really does help, uh, you know, make sure you have documentation of, of all of these things. Um, it can be stressful. Um, I've been through the process um, and don't be afraid to follow up with your insurance um, adjusters because I had a guy, he came out, he did a fantastic job of keeping in touch with me and then he disappeared. And so I called and they're like, yeah, the, the storm hit somewhere else. He was shipped somewhere else to take care of that. And I got handed off to somebody else. Ugh. And so just simply me calling them really sped that process up. And I wasn't mad at anybody. I mean, everybody was going through this. So, I mean, I totally understand. But, um, yeah, so don't be afraid to call and just say, hey, you know, where are we at on this? Do you have all the information? What can I help you with? Um, and, and just having that documentation helps out tremendously. And actually, so my dad was an insurance agent. And so I kind of tied into the whole insurance thing. And I talked to our insurance agent about that. And what he recommended is along with still photos, are videos because they said the still photos they can be faked but things like uh a video of you walking through your house and then zooming in on the 
on like the back of your TV, the serial number and the make and the model, that information and on your computers, uh, the video is much more convincing and they cannot argue against that whatsoever. So you start at one end of the house, you go to east, you know, have the thing running the whole time. These are my computers, do to do, see the serial numbers and stuff. And then moving on, this is the room they're in and you know, like that. So a video uh, in addition to the photographs. And like Kathleen said, yeah, obviously you do it before the storm and after the storm. But yeah, lots of video, lots of pictures. Okay. Something yep. to keep in mind there. I learned something. Very good. Thank you, sir. Hey, <laughs> speaking from experience. Right? Yeah. Yeah, it's always good to have like adjusters and all those people in your family. You just ask them, what do I need to do here? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, years ago, one of my coworkers, their house burnt down oh. and they had all sorts of problems with their insurance company. Mm -hmm. you know, they had said things that they were going to do and then didn't do and so forth to the point where he actually started recording their phone calls so he would have proof which actually has some of its own legal issues because at least in Texas, both parties have to know they are being recorded. Otherwise it's illegal. Uh, just to go sideways here, if you have a dash cam in your car and you have that recording the sound, you really have to legally, you're required to let any passengers in your car know that the, these, you know, whatever they say is being recorded. So, you know, if they're planning a murder or something like that, they know not to do that in the car. Anyway, Problems with it. And so Texas has, you know, part of the Texas state government, and I, I can't remember the name of it, but there's basically the people that make the insurance people do what they say. If you are having problems with your insurance company, you contact the Texas insurance, you know, organization, and they will kick, they love nothing better than to kick the asses of insurance agents not doing what they're supposed to do. And almost overnight, it was a 180 degree change in the relationship between wow. uh, my coworker and the insurance company. So wow. Wow. in your case, yeah, probably too soon. You really need you know, to show that they've repeatedly lied and didn't do things and really dragging your feet, their feet. Yeah. Um, but once the, the government, the Texas government gets involved, they have a very big hammer. Yeah. So yeah. I need to look that up. For sure. So. Um, this is, I just got a shout out to Kathleen. I thought in Texas only one person party needed to know. No, actually, uh, both parties for uh, audio recordings, both parties are supposed to know. So, cool. Yeah. Well, okay. I'm, we're recording right now. So, <laughs> yep. So, yeah, we'll not talk about murdering people. Yeah. No, just kidding. Kidding. Uh, okay. Whose turn was it? I guess, is it yours or mine? I don't know. We just uh, talked. No, okay, well, I I did the what I I did the candles and then we got an insurance and then I took over you. So go, let's go with you. Okay, um, the one thing that most people already have anyway, or hopefully you do, um, just kind of keeping in the garage is gloves and trash bags. Um, you know, cleaning up all the debris. Uh, again, just from experience in a home, face mask, um, another one of those. Dust man, yeah. We, had we to, all have those now, so yeah, yeah, don't, yeah, we should all have those. Um, you know, we had to remove like wet insulation, we had to remove broken sheetrock, um, you know, just cleaning up debris maybe in your yard, um, having, having gloves because you don't know what will blow into your yard. It's kind of amazing what shows up, um, even though it's like washed off, but still, yeah. So, having those on hand can really help out. Um, beforehand of having those gloves just to protect your hands again it's one of those things that protective gear is super important these times because okay now i've got a puncture wound and i need to go get a tetanus shot well if the power is still out where are you going to go to get a tetanus shot right mm -hmm. and so by really kind of protecting your your hands because that's that's usually the most well maybe your feet and your hands those are kind of the two places that you're more likely going to get injured with something, a, a, a nail sticking up. Yep. A, a, a roofy a, nail from the shingles and stuff that are on the. That comes, you know, gets stuck into your, your hand. I had a friend in Austin. She fell. She was near a sidewalk and there just happened to be a broken fence post. And it <laughs> went through her, her arm, her forearm. And she had to go get surgery on everything. Just random. Right. Yeah. And, and so, you know, having that, that protective equipment uh, while you're cleaning up is super important. Again, assess that risk, 
maybe on a normal day going picking up sticks in your yard, you probably wouldn't wear gloves. In that situation, just wear gloves. Yep. That's a good one. Okay. Uh, important bit of inf information. Several people checked the statute and it turns out Texas now is a one party consent state. So the people don't have to know you are recording them. So life just got a whole lot more interesting. Interesting. Thank you, Uncommon Bees and Sarah Paul for bringing that in for, and, and Kathleen. So cool. Okay. You do not need to let people know you are recording them. Okay, coming up on the safety gear and protection and all that, uh, one thing we found, so when Hurricane Ike hit our neighborhood, we had a lot of trees down, and we were you know, working together, topping them up, and we discovered we have a lot more possums and critters in our neighborhood than we expected. Yeah. And we quickly figured out that before you start working on a tree, you have a very long pole, and you start banging on the tree a bit to drive the po really upset possums and raccoons out of the tree. Because the last thing you want to do is suddenly have, you know, a possum or a raccoon, you know, clinging to your arm with fangs and claws. So that's a tip. There, there are a lot more critters in your neighborhood than you may realize oh, yeah. in the trees and so forth that, uh, you know, rode the tree down or took shelter in the fallen tree during the storm. So yeah, we had a person on critter duty who basically went and you know just whacked the trees with a big old, I think it was like a, a, a curtain rod, or not a curtain rod, the closet rod. It was like an eight foot long wooden dowel. And just before we started working on a tree, he went in there, you know, bomb squad gear on. And <laughs> so yeah, you, okay, Sarah, I know critters aren't bad, but when one suddenly launches itself out of the tree at you while you have a chainsaw in your hands. Startlement with chainsaws is a bad combination. And having, like Brandon mentioned, having to go get a tetanus shot or a rabies shot oh. when you can't even get out of the neighborhood is also bad. So yeah, before you start chopping up a tree, you know, poke it, prod it, shake it some, try and make sure there is nothing in there that's going to attack you. You know, shark, I guess in Texas it would be Alligator NATO. I don't you know alligators in the tornado. You know, her her a gator. Yeah. Oh. Anyway, yeah. You don't want to you don't want to be working on a tree and discover a you know an alligator in it. So yeah. I I I couldn't have help but help imagine you walking around your backyard with like a raccoon latched on the back <laughs> of your head and you're like, everyone just be cool. Just be cool. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why, but that's that's my image. <laughs> Uh, I know this guy. We used to work together. <laughs> yeah, I know this guy. That's a good reference. I like it. I like uh, it. You know, I haven't seen the movie yet, but that's been such memed that. And it's so good. You'll like it. I, I, yeah, it looks good. Um, Your turn. The, the only thing else that I really just kind of wanted to throw out there, um, again, some of these things... I just have just because I, I, I do lots of stuff, but not everyone may have. And that is just some really good framing nails um, for your, just to keep um, a five pound box, um, just so that if you need to nail, you know, a piece of plyboard over your window or nail something, you're not having again to leave the house. You've got it right there. They're easy to store, keep out of the way. And it's like when you need a nail, there's, there almost isn't any other option. You know, yeah. you know, trying to tie something up in, in that certain fashion is really not going to work. You just need a nail. Yeah, it's hard to zip tie something to a window. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So having something along those lines um, is is super duper handy. I know they make like the little clips for for windows with the boards, and that's great. But I use, if yeah. On, on doing that, then sure, go for it. Um, but yeah, just simple things that we sometimes just don't consider that mm. when you need it, you're just like damn, I really need that at this point. Yep. Yeah. So another thing you mentioned to me when we were talking once uh, with the whole tree on your roof, mm -hmm. it was after a big storm and you started just kind of calling, you know, different tree people to try and find. And so I need to make a shout out here because they treat me really well, but Arbor True, you know, it might be worth having a tree person already in, you know, have a relationship with them. So another shout out for Arbor True, uh, especially in an area with a lot of trees that could fall on your house. Yeah. Uh, you know, if they know you, they already have, uh, 
you know, a relationship. It kind of puts you up to the front. And if you, I can't promise if you say, hey, Mark Merriweather, Vorderbergen recommended you, it will bump you up some. But uh, I'm, I'm up there with the, the management. So hopefully it might. Yeah, that, yeah that's so, so true. I mean, we got really lucky that we had already uh, had a relationship with this company and I, I knew the, the, the guy. And with, with that, I'm, I'm sure with Arbitru, it's not that big of a deal. But anytime you hire someone for something like tree cutting, you want to make sure that they're insured and they're bonded. Mm -hmm. um, if they cut the tree and it causes more damage or something along those lines, you're not held liable for that uh, right. at, that, at that point. Um, so, yeah, so definitely go with a reputable company um, in those situations for sure. Yeah, good, yeah. Call. good call. And actually, that brings up another important thing that you need to be aware of. So, again, like after Hurricane Ike, all the neighbors were working together to chop up the trees and help everyone and all that. Mm -hmm. There's still a liability issue there. If someone is up on your roof and falls and gets hurt, it, it could be very fine, uh, very devastating to the person that fell, yeah. um, but it can also be very devastating to you. So sometimes maybe the best thing is to throw a big tarp over it yeah. and let someone who's bonded and insured take care of it. And that's one of those risk assessment things that you, you know, like to do. What is the risk here? Yeah. No, that's 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 really good thing to point out is. Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're trying to you know helping people out, that's what we want to do. We want to come together and do that, and and I totally support that. We also have to consider what are the repercussions if somebody does slip and fall, uh, some injury, something mm -hmm. along those lines. Yeah, good call. Um, I know we've only got a little bit of time, uh, but I did want to plug CERT. Yes, please. So, uh, uh, CERT um, is Community Emergency Response Team. And I really need to go go back and just kind of beef up my training again myself because it's it's been it's been a minute since I've taken my classes, but um, CERT is fantastic um, in terms of learning what you need to do to kind of organize your community together, uh, what type of responses uh, that are expected, kind of the correct things to go in and do. And what's really kind of cool about the, the course that I found was it was broad enough to give you an idea of kind of generally what you could expect, but you could really go down some interesting paths here. Um, some really got into communications with the ham radio. Excellent. Some people went uh, more into the first aid aspect of it. Some went into things like search and rescue, which is one of the areas that I'm kind of interested in. Um, I got to go do a search and recovery on this one. Um, and so, there's a lot of different facets of this. And, and what's really cool is if you can get maybe one or two, maybe three people else in your community to take the class with you, and then you kind of have your built-in system within your neighborhood. Um, mm. And that's really, really a good resource to have uh, because then it's a, it's a group of people that you know, uh, for the most part at least, are not super crazy, <laughs> but they're trained, right? They're, they're good <laughs> they harness to their craziness, I think is what you're trying to say. Right, they can focus it into good and not evil, right? Uh, and so, sometimes, but uh, yeah, it's a really good class. Mark, I know that you've taken this as well. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts on, on CERT? So two really, really good things that come out of this, and, and uh, this might sound... Somewhat selfish, but okay. One, it's always better to be the person with the clipboard than talking to the person with the clipboard. Yeah. <laughs> so, and that's the same with the, like the Red Cross shelters where I volunteer at and so forth. Uh, it's always better to be on the, you know, the, the organization side than someone, you know, asking for help. Yeah. So there's that. Obviously, the whole community preparedness sort of thing, absolutely fantastic thing, because when it comes down to it, like I said, for the first three days, it is just the resources you have available. And so the more resources, the more training, the more skills that have been stacked on one another, the better off your community is going to be. And then going back to the selfish thing, uh, one of the things with the, the cert paperwork and the clipboard and the vest you are allowed back into your neighborhood more quickly than like, like let's say there's a mandatory evacuation and everyone has to leave the, the cert people for the community are some of the first that are allowed back in. So that's another good thing, you know, from a 
you get to check on your stuff too. So, I mean, the, it's great to do things for the community, but I found pointing out also the the you know the benefits to you yourself uh, are often what closes the deal on this. So definitely the cert training, really amazing stuff. Like Brandon mentioned, you know, search and rescue, how to assess a house. I mean, in Louisiana, they're the teams going house to house, you know, yeah. collapsed structures and, and knowing which ones are safe to get into and how to get into them safely and check to make sure there's no one in there and then what codes to spray paint on the side of the house and things like that. Yeah. It's critical in times like this that they have, you know, the, we can't afford to have a, you know, a team of people here all the time ready to do, do this. It falls on us citizens yeah. to do this, to be, to step up and go, all right, you know, I'm the one running towards danger to help yeah. because it's needed. So you, know, you get to feel good about yourself and you also get some bonuses from it. So it's like a win-win. Yeah. You get to wear that cool hat and you get a cool vest. Yeah. And uh, green. How can you go wrong with green? Yeah. That's, I like it. yeah. <laughs> Reflective. I wonder if I could get them to pay for my shortwave radio stuff. That would be awesome. Probably not. Oh, well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. I'm looking through the questions here or, or the statements. Um, yeah, actually, Kathleen mentions, yeah, if you live in the Gulf Coast area, keep your tinnitus vaccination up to date always. I just had mine done at the, the latest uh, wellness check. It was been 10 years. Right. But that brings up something that I was going to mention and I forgot. And I, I mentioned a little bit, but roofing nails. So when the hurricanes come through, there's one of the things they pull off are the shingles. And occasionally you get roofing nails. So a big magnet. Uh, just to go through your yard, you know, have, you know, a kid do it or something, check your yard for nails, sweep the, the streets for nails. Cause you don't want to step in a nail later on. You don't want the lawnmower to send a, a nail flying and you don't want nails in the road, flattening the tires of people, you know, heading out because of an emergency. Yeah. So, you know, the Harbor freight has some big old magnets for pennies yeah. that you can just try dry, uh, tied to a string and drag through your yard and, and, you know, pull up whatever nails that way. I need to grab so, one of those. Yeah. 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 I, I want to add to that. Like we, we've always heard a rusty nail for tetanus, any, any outdoor, anything outdoors mm -hmm. can give you tetanus. So if you're like, Oh, a stick, you know, a punctured still tetanus, uh, because it's just lying dormant out. Mm -hmm. all over the place. So it's not just nails. So just be aware of that. Have you ever met anyone that actually had caught tetanus? This I have, and I don't think so I don't. Yeah, think so. so one of the old names for tetanus was lock jaw. Yes, because yes. it would lock up the the jaws. And I knew a guy he he, he could he could only move he couldn't move his his jaw oh. because he he had had tetanus, and so he could not move his jaw because of that. And that was actually considered lucky because some of the other things uh, supposedly it's an extremely painful depending on which muscles it attacks. It causes all these cramps and horrible horrible things you know like the bends almost yeah but yeah tetanus is not i mean it's rare to run into someone that actually had tetanus because the vaccines work so well and so many people are taken care of but it's not a you know like kathleen said you know stay up on your tetanus shot because all year round here in texas it's always out there yeah yeah good call good call okay uh what else do we have? I'm just scanning through. Yeah, Henry Schaefer, deck screws are nice. Yes. So, yeah, the deck screws with the screws. And uh, a, an old-time woodworker taught me, you know, the cordless screwdrivers are great. I know Uncommon Bees is a huge fan of, what, the, yeah, the Ryobi. But, you know, the old brace and bit, you know, the, the hand crank ones? I got to, When there's no power and you want to limit your cordless drill use for really important things, that old base and uh, brace and bit with yeah. a little screwdriver attachment in it that will drive you know that will attach plywood to the side of your house just fine yeah so yeah. something to keep in mind there with with uh, uh deck screw or any screws and nails um make sure you're getting the the correct rated because like nails have really good shear strength they'll bend but a lot of screws 
will not bend. They don't have a lot of shear strength and they're just snap. Oh, so yeah. On what you want to use for. And this is a huge argument in the woodworking world, like carpentry, like when to use a screw, when to use carriage bolts, when to use lags. However, yeah, deck screws work really well for a lot of different purposes, especially temporary stuff. So yeah, I'm totally yeah. cool with that. Yeah, that's a good call. A lot easier to back out than a nail. Exactly. That's why the capped nails, the, you know, like we mentioned earlier, if you're attaching a tarp to the roof, you want to get the capped nail. So the regular nail with basically a plastic bottle cap on the top to increase the surface area that they're holding the tarp down. And it also offers a little protection when you're going back to pull them out with the, you know, the hammer. Yeah. And just a shout out, Mark W. Dam missed most of it. Uh, oh. This video will be available on YouTube. And here on the Forging Texas website, uh, forever or until I get kicked off Facebook. So <laughs> we'll see. All right, 859. Um, yeah, it looks like uh, a lot of a lot of people like the show. Cool. Right. Always a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thank um, you. We need to think up what the, the next one will be. Oh, hey, I, I got to how, how How are you coming on the ham radio? Uh, license and all that. Mm. So with the not not very far. I've I've honestly started falling down uh, the GMRS radio rabbit hole. Uh, but yes, I I need to get on my hand radio. I've 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 obviously got everything ready. Um, I just need to go take that damn test. Test. Um, yep. I, and, I will get on that. I will. I will. I promise. I, I think now because of COVID, they're even offering the test online. You don't even have to go. Yeah. So yeah, no excuse, man. No excuse. No. And now I, we can we can talk over the radio because we know which repeaters and stuff. I know. I I I want to do that, and I I love the little GMRS radios, and I like those simply because it's accessible to everybody. Um, as a matter of fact, I took mine out uh, the other day, just driving down 45, and I was picking up chatter, and I'm like, all right, finally some people are are talking on these things. Um, but yeah, I know. I'll I'll get on it. I'll get on it. Okay. All right. I'm gonna hold you to that, man. Okay. <laughs> okay. It is 901. We have come to the end of another episode. Episode 76. 76 episodes, man. Awesome, Amazing. Awesome. So hopefully you got some useful information. Uh the last I looked at the storms out in the Atlantic and so forth, it looks like Texas is relatively okay, knocking on wood, because that's what scientists do. We don't want to drink you. Um, so <laughs> I guess, uh, next week I'm thinking I will be discussing pine and pine trees and all the amazing stuff about pine trees. Uh, this is subject to change though, but again, thank you very much, Brandon, for, for showing up and, and, you know, hanging with me and letting me talk over you. And, and, and I tried to hopefully, uh, gave you, you know, a chance to talk to but uh and of course the tribe see you all tomorrow 7 30 ish now usually i've been starting early now seven you know sometime before 7 30 until 8 a.m 8 a.m is a hard stop for the donut shop at the beginning of the world where we just talk about random stuff like we're all sitting around a table at a donut shop and whatever pops into our head okay at this note this point I'm going to release you all. We now return you to your normal scheduled activities. So end broadcast.